Black Girls Podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 251 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. We'll jump into the episode after a word from our sponsors. Shingles? Oh, boy. My wife did not have a good time. You mean that rash she had? Yeah. She said she'll never forget the pain, the burning, the rash lasted for weeks, and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. Well, actually, there's a vaccine that can prevent shingles. What? what? Yeah, shingles can be prevented. Shingles, shingles can, can be, be what? what? Prevent it. 50 years or older, talk to your pharmacist today about shingles vaccination. This advertisement is brought to you by GSK. You know the Banks family, but not like this. Peacock's new original series, Bel Air, reimagines the iconic Fresh Prince of Bel Air, but as a drama in modern day America. When Will is forced to leave his home in West Philly for the gated mansions of Bel Air, it's a once in a lifetime second chance, but can he stay true to himself on the path to greatness? Executive produced by Will Smith and Westbrook Studios, Bel Air is streaming now exclusively on Peacock. Go to PeacockTV.com to sign up. What happens when vanilla gets toasted? and hand shaken with ice. You get the new ice toasted vanilla oat milk shaken espresso at Starbucks. It's a toasted new take on vanilla paired with shots of rich espresso and creamy oat milk. It's the perfect springtime pick-me-up that helps you feel good from the inside out. Try the new ice toasted vanilla oat milk shaken espresso at Starbucks. Order it ahead with the Starbucks app today. Netflix just wrapped up season two of its hit reality show, Love is Blind. And y'all know we had to discuss. Joining me again today to chat about what we saw this season is Beverly Andre. Beverly is a licensed marriage and family therapist, relationship coach, and founder of Be Heart Counseling Services. She and I chatted about how this season compared to season one, the impact of having your relationship chronicled so publicly, and whether a relationship can survive if there is not an instant attraction. If there's something that resonates with you while enjoying our conversation, please share it with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. Or join us over in the sister circle to talk more in depth about the episode. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. Here's our conversation. Well, I am so excited to chat with you again, Beverly, my fellow colleague and friend in the pop culture loving world. <laughs> I know it's a rare few, but we're out here. We are out here. Okay. Watching all the things so that y'all don't have to, or that you might be inspired to. <laughs> Exactly. So we have just seen the wrap up of season two of Love is Blind. And so I am curious to hear your thoughts. So this is a unedited conversation because we haven't checked in with one another about how we feel. Right. We haven't been tweeting back and forth about it. So I don't even know how you are feeling about season two. So tell me, how would you compare season two to season one? Like, did you love it more, less? Was it about the same? I think that when it got to the reunion that that's when I became invested because I felt like some of the storylines, I felt like we had higher expectations for season two versus season one. You had Lauren and we were all rooting for her. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like a sister. And she found true love and all of that. And then, so we're like, okay, well they have more sisters on this season. So we're like, okay, well, let's see what they're going to do. Let's see how they continue with the same energy of season one. And I think a lot of people had a letdown because there wasn't a clear couple to root for. (laughs) It felt like, 
oh, who am I going to root for? I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I guess. Who's left? (laughs) I I guess. (laughs) So, you know, Mm -hmm. I have definitely been thinking about that, too, because it definitely felt like it was such a new experiment, right? Like, we also Mm -hmm. both watched Married at First Sight. And so this felt kind of in that same vein. And I think it's actually the same production company. So that makes sense that it it feels similar. But it was also Mm -hmm. like a unique twist, right? That they wouldn't even see each other. I mean, they had to form this whole relationship through these pods. Mm -hmm. And so season one, I thought was really fresh and really exciting and interesting. Mm -hmm. And then season two, you're right. I also had high expectations because I really enjoyed season one. And I did feel like season two was a bit of a letdown because I just wasn't as invested in like the cast in the same way. And I wonder how much of that is due to the fact that season one was such a smash, right? And so they had the benefit of nobody having been on that show before for season one, whereas season two, then I think you get into like, okay, are these people actually here to kind of be honest and go through the experiment? Are these people who want to like get an influencer career popping off or Hollywood? Like what are their real motivations? Mm -hmm. And so it felt like I didn't necessarily like as many of the cast members this season as I did last season. Right. And what you said about the familiarity with Married at First Sight and Love is Bond, I felt that even more this season. And I think that season one, we gave this show a lot of benefit of the doubt because we had no expectations. We really didn't know. And so it was like a welcoming surprise. And I feel in my heart of hearts that people started becoming a little bit more skeptic to see, oh, will people actually fall in love this time around? Mm-hmm. Right? Because mm-hmm. with Lauren and Cameron, it was just like, oh my gosh, they made it. This actually works. Yeah. Now the second time around, well, does it really work? Yeah. Hmm. We don't know. You don't know. <laughs> and it definitely seemed like, you know, especially some contestants in particular, it felt like the first season, like people really went into it with this idea that, okay, I am going to get to know these people outside of like anything physical. Whereas this season, it definitely felt like people were trying to gauge like Shake's infamous question around, would I be able to pick you up at a concert and put you on my show? This kind of thing. Like, so people were trying to gauge some physicality, I think, that I don't remember seeing as much with the first season. Right. I think Shake definitely represented what a lot of people thought was going to be present in season one. Yes. Like, oh, it's going to be superficial. Oh, it's only going to be sexy looking people. And I think that the show definitely took that into account because there was plus size women. I mean, they disappeared. I mean, we don't know what happened. We don't know (laughs) what happened. But I think they were more conscientious about how people responded to season one and how they craved the authenticity well, as authentic as you can get with reality TV, people want love. People want to go to the ends of the earth hoping that this is something that's actually attainable. And I think that's what season one gave. Season one gave that. Mm -hmm. Like, you can actually find it in the most (laughs) weird moments, very unique circumstances, you can find it. And I think people are looking to see, can I still find love? Is it true? Will this formula work for me? Mm. Or is this going to be something that was for entertainment? Okay, hook and sinker. You got me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing about this, and I feel like this is like a mashup conversation between Love is Blind and Married at First Sight, because I think that there are some similarities. And so the premise for both of these shows is that there is like something in your normal dating life that hasn't been working. Right. So I try to do the online dating sites. I try to ask friends for recommendations, you know, paying attention in the grocery store to see who might be interesting. Right. And none of that is working. And so now I'm going to try this thing that is maybe like a more extreme dating so to speak and I would love to hear your thoughts about do you think there is some truth to having an outsider decide what's good for you or like going against what you're typically interested in because that seems to be like the piece that is the key like in Married at First Sight there's the panel of experts not necessarily matchmakers but experts who pair the people and then of course on love is blind you're going into it with okay i'm not gonna lead with physical attraction i'm gonna try to lead with something else so what do you think about that 
It's really interesting that you were like, someone needs to take over. When for me, I see it as a collaborative approach. I feel like the people show up and say, these are my expectations. These are the things that have been working for me. These are the things that have not been working for me. Like there's something that they give, they give information or data, right? And these experts take that data and then they formulate a plan with the hopes that it'll yield the results that the person ultimately wants to see, which is being in partnership. And just like with every experiment, you hope that it works out, but it's not a guarantee. You try to remove as many barriers as possible to see whether or not the desired outcome can occur. Hmm. Yeah, and it might work or it might not, <laughs> as we see in it these cases. Work because you have the human element, right? Right. You can't control what people ultimately do. But if I'm saying, oh, like I don't feel like people get to know me because they get sucked into what I look like or all of these things. So what are you going to do? Okay, let's remove the barrier of looks. Mm -hmm. Let's see if personality is enough. And then secondary looks can be an added bonus or like figure out what's not working in your dating life. And then let's capitalize on all the other things. So I'm glad you brought up the issue of attraction, because, again, I think that that is like a key element in both of these shows, right, is that you are kind of leaving it up to chance that you may be attracted to this person, but you know that you won't know because you are not like picking for yourself. And so it does seem like for the couples who have a better chance of the relationship lasting it seems like one of the key factors is that there is that like initial attraction. And it seems like the couples who there is not that initial attraction. I don't know any instance besides Doug and Jamie from whatever season of Married at First Sight. And that might still be questionable. You taking a sip. People can't see that, but I see you. But they are the only ones that I can remember where there wasn't an instant attraction, but they like work to overcome that. And then they continued in the relationship. And so what role does attraction actually play in like a long-term satisfying, healthy relationship? Attraction is tied to desire. It's tied to sexual attraction. Like, do I want to have sex with you? Do I want to kiss you? Do I want to cuddle with you? However, attraction is not the end all be all to that. You can build on that. I think people are fixated with the type. People have their type. And when you allow your fixation with your type to put you in a box, anything outside of that, you don't even give it credit. You don't allow yourself to be open to building attraction, right? Because at the end of the day, you can say you want X, Y, and Z, but that's not lasting, Anything could happen. What if they get into a car accident and they're disfigured? What if there's a fire? What if they start graying early? There's just so many things that can affect somebody's appearance. If you allow that to be the bulk of why you're with someone, it's not enough to keep you in the relationship. And so I think seeing Jamie from Mass, yes, Doug was not her type. But I think that she's attracted to her husband. They got kids. Mm -hmm. They report that they are happily married and that they're in love with each other and that they're attracted to each other. And eventually she chose to work on that. Like, can I be attracted to this person? Because attraction can be, oh, you're washing the dishes for me. And that allows me the ability to go sit down and relax. Oh, you take care of me. Oh, all of these things build attraction. All these things are foreplay. All of these things makes that person that you're with or considering sexier. It's not just what they look like. Because mm -hmm. you can find someone who's fine and their attitude and everything else is just trash. Mm, very good point. And so do you have some tips for how attraction builds later? You're right in all of that, right? Like anything can change. And like we know attraction waxes and wanes throughout the life cycle of a relationship. But it does feel like, at least from these shows, it's harder when that initial attraction is not there. So if, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody is not in a reality TV kind of situation, what kinds of things can be done to build attraction into a relationship if it's not there initially? I think 
really taking a look at what your type is or why they're not attractive to you. If you're looking for someone who is way over six feet, but the guy that is pursuing you is under six feet, are you going to reconsider? Does that make him less attractive because he's shorter? You know what I mean? Like think about what the attraction is tied to. Okay. You want somebody who has a six pack. He has a two (laughs) or a no pack. (laughs) That's something that could change. If working out is important to you and you're like, you know what? I find it so sexy when you're like physically active and like, I would love for you to join me in running or babe, let's go on a walk or anything under the sun. That person's willingness to like, okay, well, my partner likes this. Let me take that into consideration or you're dating and you hear the person say, oh, I love that cologne that you're wearing. You may not find them attractive, but something about that cologne is attracting you. Being conscientious to what are the things that you do like? Because if you start looking for all the things that you don't like, there is no way to build an attractiveness to somebody that you're continuously analyzing and chipping away, right? So you got to be careful with that. Be careful about your typecasting you because you may just be considered as that guy or that girl that, oh yeah, like mm, don't even bother talking to them because they only want the Instagram model or they only want the guy who can flex on the beach. Like people got to like you (laughs) to be like builds attraction. So there needs to be something with your personality that allows someone to be attracted to you, to like being around you. You know, you bring up a really good point around looking for the things that you do like about them as opposed to like constantly analyzing and being critical of the things that you don't like. Cause I definitely feel like now I feel like some other stuff is probably going on with shake too, but I definitely feel like that is what was happening in his relationship with deep D, you know, at least from what we saw, there would be all this conversation around like how she was such a great partner and she was helping him like rethink things in his business. And he felt like for this next leg of his career, she would be somebody who would be a great support and could really like do a lot. He could see himself building a life with her, but there was not the attraction. Right. And he would, of course, let anybody who would listen say that as often as he could. But I definitely feel like he was being super critical throughout this season about her looks. I know that they said that there were other comments that were made that were just terrible. Right. And what they showed wasn't that bad. I do have clients who are from Indian culture, Indian backgrounds. And one of the things that they've talked to me about is how colorism plays a factor and how certain regions and certain aesthetic is supported more than others. And it was very clear to me that both Deepi and Shake said that they've never dated another brown person Mm -hmm. before. And I feel like that's very telling because in conversation with one of the people that is from the same background, they said that the lighter you are, the better, because the goal is to lighten up the lineage. And Priyanka, she's not that light. Mm -hmm. She is of darker skin. And in the conversation about Deep Tea, they were like, she contradicts what certain families would want. I don't know if you've ever seen Indian Matchmaker on mm-hmm. Netflix, but that was one of the key issues that was talked about. So I really wonder how much of a cultural influence impacted Shake's ability to even consider her as a partner mm-hmm. beyond the physical. I'm not saying what he was saying was right or anything like that, but I think it would behoove us to look at that cultural aspect to see that if he could even allow himself to be attracted to her Mm -hmm. because of the background. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, and I think that that was one of the more interesting pieces of the conversations we saw between Shake and Deep Deep was that they both had not dated other brown people, right? And so it did seem at least like they recognized like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. Like, it's cool to be talking with somebody who knows like all this family stuff and knows why I would want to dress a particular way on the wedding and have these rituals and, you know, these kinds of things. And so I think at least for Deep D, it sounds like in listening to interviews with her post show, now this is something that's more attractive to her, right? Like she's interested in maybe dating more brown people. I'm not sure if that is the case. For she. Yeah, she didn't cry. <laughs> well, I don't know. It, is that substantiated? I mean, I have definitely seen them like playing around on Instagram and TikTok. I don't know. Somebody posted a video of them like <laughs> look like they was on a date. I don't know. They may just be friends. Right. But I think it was really interesting when Shake was like, he, it feels like I'm dating my auntie. And I wonder if 
because that was his first time ever dating somebody from the same culture, that that familiarity felt familial yeah. for him mm-hmm. versus, oh, this is what it's like to date somebody where I don't have to explain my background. And I think sometimes when people are dating other folks who may have very similar backgrounds, it becomes like a friend zone situation as opposed to, oh, like we have the same background or similar backgrounds and we can vibe and we can connect. But that doesn't mean that I still can't be attracted to you because you're not completely different or opposite. Because when you're first dating, the difference is like exciting. Oh, you like this? Or, oh, tell me more about this. As opposed to somebody who has a very similar background than you, it's like, okay, well, what else is there for us to talk about? Or what else is there about you that's interesting? Because I feel like I know so much about you by circumstances because we have very similar backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. More from my conversation with Beverly after the break. Okay, y'all, just a heads up that spring is on its way. And this is your friendly reminder to start thinking about how you're going to refresh your wardrobe for the new season. Do you need some new tops and bold colors to wear with your favorite jeans? What about some new flats that transition easily from running errands to brunch with the girls? And don't forget the cute sweaters and cardigans to throw on for those days when it's still a little chilly. Whatever you're looking for, Macy's has got you covered. And if you need help figuring out exactly what your spring style is, you can chat one-on-one with one of Macy's personal stylists in-store or from the comfort of your home. And best of all, it's completely free. Head on over to Macy's.com slash personal stylist to book your appointment today. That's Macy's.com slash personal stylist. What happens when vanilla gets toasted and handshaken with ice? You get the new ice toasted vanilla oat milk shaken espresso at Starbucks. It's a toasted new take on vanilla paired with shots of rich espresso and creamy oat milk. It's the perfect springtime pick-me-up that helps you feel good from the inside out. Try the new ice toasted vanilla oat milk shaken espresso at Starbucks. Order it ahead with the Starbucks app today. It's a new year and you deserve a fresh start in all parts of your life, even at work. Take your team to the next level with a hiring partner that makes it simple to find candidates with the right skills. That's Indeed. Indeed makes it easy to attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy. And more than 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com therapy. Offer valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com slash therapy to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash therapy. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. The couple that, of course, I think probably was most interesting to both you and I was, now now why are you leaning in like that? Was most interesting to you and I was Ayana and Jared. I will definitely be honest in saying that I definitely had to warm up to them as a couple after the whole fiasco with like Mallory, right? Because I feel like I over identified with Ayana just being a sister, right? And like, she was so vulnerable in like sharing like so much of her life experience and her history. And the way that she fell down in the hall after she had the conversation with Jared, where she found out that he had not proposed, but proposed ish to Mallory felt like, oh my gosh, right? Like you could just feel the despondency maybe. I don't even know what would be the best word to describe it. And then like she gave him another chance, right? And so I'm like, oh, you better not hurt her. You better not, right? But it definitely seems like at least in, you know, hearing them in the reunion and like in post-show conversations, it definitely feels like they have had lots of conversations about how all of that went down. And, you know, in honesty, I mean, I guess it is kind of a part of the experiment, right? That you are dating multiple people, but the way that that all transpired, and again, we don't have timestamps, so we don't even know like, 
what day did he have this conversation with Mallory versus with Ayana? And so it felt like it was in quick succession, right? Like it felt like it was a day or two maybe that had passed. But I definitely have warmed up to them. It does feel like they have done a lot of work. It feels like to kind of get on the same page in terms of being a couple. He has apologized both privately and publicly for how all of that played out. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about what you saw go down with them. I have a lot of thoughts. (laughs) I have a lot of thoughts because it's it was like a both and for me. I'm not like super on one side. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, yes, it is a show where you're dating multiple people to see who you fit with, right? So it was very plausible that something like this would have happened between Jarrett Mallory and Ayana. Mm-hmm. I get it. I will say seeing good sis in the hallway when she's saying... I sank with her. <laughs> I, I slid off my couch. I was like, ooh, because I felt that. Yeah. And the reason why I felt that was because not ever knowing if somebody is with you because they want to be with you or because of circumstance is hard. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember listening to Gabrielle Union, her book. Was it, I think I'm going to need more wine, I think. The first one or the second one? The second one. Got the anything one. stronger. Got anything stronger, yes. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I will never know for sure whether or not Dwayne is with me because he wants to be with me or because of circumstance. And to hold that, to hold the unknown of the weight of that and to move forward in relationship is not an easy feat. It means you are willing to hold on to what the relationship is and can be. And that's all that you can walk with. And I think Ayana had to really sit with what that meant to say, I am still going to say yes to him. I am still going to try and make this work or see what happens, knowing that this is going to be seen, you know, around the world and people will have so many thoughts about her and to still say, yes, she wants love and she's in a relationship and she's married and she has to live in that relationship. So I felt when she sank down, I understood why. You know, I don't know if it's true. Ayana, you can hit me up, girl, and let me know. We can have a conversation. But I really felt the weight of that. Do I still say yes or do I say no? And if I'm saying yes, what am I saying yes to? Is me saying yes to this, does that mean I'm saying no to me? You know, like Mm -hmm. it's just so many thoughts and questions. I think that where Jared definitely had to be held accountable is for the conversation that he had with Mallory. However, it looked with editing, the flow of conversation in that time frame, it just felt messy. And he owned up to it. He apologized for it. But I will say, like, after Jared, excluding that, after Jared, you know, said yes or proposed to Ayana. I ain't never hear him talk about Mallory outside of that one. It felt like that was their version of trying to have a closed conversation. And they both said that, Mm -hmm. that that's what that was. That was the first time that they seen each other and they never had a close, which I get. It just ventured on the line of disrespect and they both apologized for it. But after that, Jared was like, team Ayana. Like, I ain't never hear him mention anything about Mallory after that. And so I think... At the reunion, you could literally, I mean, first of all, they came coordinated. I was like, come on, black couple. Hello. (laughs) Um, You saw that there was like a very intimate way that they were sitting next to each other and also a protective way that Jared was like, the body was very protective because they know, they know that they're going to play these clips. And even Ayana was like, it was really hard watching that, but we've had those conversations outside not in front of the cameras. And so that shows to me that somebody was held accountable. Somebody actively did the repair work and decided to still stay in and do the repair work anytime it comes up. Because I'm pretty sure after the reunion and her watching that clip, feelings came up probably. And you still have to do the repair work because your choices affected this person. And until they're able to like process it in a healthy way, 
you are still held accountable. Mm -hmm. The language that you're using is very much like what we hear after there has been like infidelity in the relationship, right? right? So anytime that there's a betrayal in the relationship, which I think this could be seen as, right? Definitely. There is like continuous repair work that has to be done. But you brought up a great point that I would love to hear you talk more about because of course this happened in this way on the show, right? It's entertainment. We know that they're dating multiple people, but there are instances in real life off TV where maybe you find out that you're not somebody's first choice, right? So maybe this is somebody who has been married before. You know, there are lots of different circumstances that someone might find themselves in, like you use the Gabrielle Union quote of not being sure if they pick me because of this or that. And so if you had a client that you were working with, what kinds of things might you do to help them process where they found themselves in a relationship? I will definitely have a conversation about what feelings are coming up for them. Is this triggering an insecurity? Do you have past experiences where you may not have been prioritized or chosen first in other aspects of your life, right? Because I need to know, are we just talking about this situation in isolation or is this connected to past experiences? Because then that opens up what we're really working with. And so it's really important that we dissect that because those patterns of experiences can become a belief. And so I'm not only just challenging the belief, I'm challenging these past experiences. So let's process it. Let's see if there's a possibility for us to reframe it, right? Just like in the situation with Ayana, let's say she's on my virtual therapeutic couch and she's just like, you know what, this was the situation. I'm like, all right. So yes, your feelings, your hurt and all of that, totally get it. But let's talk about the experience. Like, Do you believe that his choices were intentionally to hurt you, right? You are hurt, but do you believe that he was intentionally trying to hurt you? No? Okay. So his choice, you being hurt is a byproduct of that, right? Got it. So did he apologize? Yes, he's apologized. Okay. How has he apologized? Well, he's apologized verbally. When I want to talk about it, he talks about it as well. Okay. So what does the apology look like in action? How has his behavior changed? Right? So we start really looking at what has that person who hurt you done to do the repair work? If you're feeling betrayed, is this person actively trying to betray you because they want to hurt you? Or was it a circumstantial event? Because sometimes we don't give our partners or the people in our lives the benefit of the doubt. And we allow their choice to fuel these beliefs that we already have. Like, oh, like, of course, no one's going to have my side. Of course, they were bound to betray me, right? Is it that or is it something else? So challenging the belief and really connecting the choice with what you're seeing in terms of how that person is treating you will allow you to really understand, okay, how am I feeling? Why am I feeling? And is this really a factual experience or am I fueling a belief that may be a little misguided? So it seems like you're being very careful in using this language of, did they do it on purpose? What difference does whether, because if I'm hurt, I'm hurt, right? So why does it make a difference about whether the person intentionally hurt me or it was a byproduct of something else? Because I think knowing somebody's intentions will allow you to give them grace. Everybody knows my coworker, Sherlock, (laughs) we have a love-hate relationship. And I know sometimes Sherlock will like, you know, be around my feet and doing all these other things while I'm trying to move on about my day. And there are times where I trip over him. If I don't give Sherlock the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to automatically think, why are you trying to trip me? You want me to fall down and get hurt? Why are you doing this? As opposed to let me take a beat and take a benefit of the doubt. Okay, he's just trying to play and he doesn't really have a good sense of where I'm moving. He just wants to be closer to me. And because of that, I tripped over him. Got it. So me taking a beat to figure out, did you plan this? What, what, what Was this a, a preconceived idea or was it just a circumstance, right? And then I'm able to give more grace. I'm like, you know, I get a little irritated. I'm like, you know what, Sherlock? It's okay. All right, let's go play. Let's figure out what it is that you ultimately want. And then let's go on about our business. Yeah, I'm talking about a dog, but it's the same thing with my partner, right? My partner makes a choice or he forgets something. I'm like, why are you always trying to forget? Like, do you not want me to do da 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 da? I can think like that, but that doesn't serve our relationship. 
me not giving him the benefit of the doubt in that moment did absolutely nothing for us versus, well, okay, let's talk. Let's have a conversation because the relationship ultimately matters to me the most. And I want to make sure that, you know, we're on the same page and that we can limit these circumstances from happening or whatever the situation was. Yeah. I appreciate that that articulation of that that I think is super helpful. So something else you mentioned that I have also been thinking about is that we not only have whatever like happens on the show, then we have like the public's reaction to it, right? So, I mean, that's a part of the, you know, they know they're signing up for entertainment, but I think there is no way to know how you'll be impacted by like, the public's reaction to whatever they see of you on the mm-hmm. film or the tape. And so what suggestions or thoughts do you have around how you like manage that in the relationship? But like, I think especially, you know, we have definitely seen shake I and mean, he of course is not in a relationship with deep D anymore, but we've definitely seen him sharing lots of things on social media. But I think even for like Natalie and Shane and Ayana and Jared, what's the other couple that was color coordinated in the blue? Oh, you're talking about Danielle and Nick. Danielle and Nick, yeah. So the public, I think, has had very strong reactions to like lots of things that we've seen shared. And so now the couples are not only dealing with like, okay, whatever is going on in regular couples world. Now we're also dealing with like the public's reaction to what they've seen of us. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think specifically with Danielle and Nick, like Danielle definitely put out a post about giving more context to when they were in Mexico and how she was triggered and and had certain memories. And so I think as a viewer, understanding that what we're seeing is, it was with intention that we're seeing this. Like we're, we're seeing it for a specific purpose as opposed to many other moments that the couples had. And so being able to understand that, yes, this is a moment, but this is not the entire experience. And the same thing for the couples, that what the viewers are seeing is just a moment. It's not the entire experience. And however you want to deal with it, whether you want to, you know, expound on it, just like Danielle did, or if you choose to say, you know what, we got to chalk it up to what it is because we are unable to control the opinions of millions, And at the end of the day, if I know why I'm with you and you know why you're with me, then we have to allow that to be enough. And we may need to bar what we're seeing online because if we allow whatever we're seeing online to infiltrate us, then it doesn't give us a chance to do well. And that's for them as couples and that's for couples regardless like of whatever status, whether you're a celebrity or a non-celebrity. Anytime you look at things online, it gives you the opportunity to compare your relationship to whatever it is that you're looking at, whether it's for the positive or for the negative. And so I think that when it comes to protecting your partner, that also means protecting your relationship. That also means protecting it from things that can infiltrate your experience in the relationship. And so that's something that I would definitely say for the couples in regards to them trying to work it out and be in relationship to each other. Because, you know, I've seen people talk about Ayana and Jared like, oh, well, Jared, he's a typical whatever, whatever, whatever. And it's just like if Ayana sees that and she starts to believe it, that may fuel some of those thoughts about, well, did you really want to be with me? Right. As opposed to, well, we've made a decision. Now we need to live out in that decision. And part of living out in that decision means we got to protect our decision. Right. We got to protect our choice. We got to protect us. Yeah, for sure. More from my conversation with Beverly after the break. Okay, y'all, just a heads up that spring is on its way. And this is your friendly reminder to start thinking about how you're going to refresh your wardrobe for the new season. Do you need some new tops and bold colors to wear with your favorite jeans? What about some new flats that transition easily from running errands to brunch with the girls? And don't forget the cute sweaters and cardigans to throw on for those days when it's still a little chilly. Whatever you're looking for, Macy's has got you covered. And if you need help figuring out exactly what your spring style is, you can chat one-on-one with one of Macy's personal stylists in-store or from the comfort of your home. And best of all, it's completely free. 
head on over to Macy's.com slash personal stylist to book your appointment today. That's Macy's.com slash personal stylist. Walmart is committed to helping you live better now. That's why they're supporting women entrepreneurs by making it easy to find and shop products from women-owned businesses. This Women's History Month, we at Seneca Women would like to recognize Walmart in celebrating women-owned businesses found in their stores. On a special episode of Here's Something Good, we got to hear firsthand the unique stories and challenges faced by women-owned businesses and how Walmart helped propel them forward. I was very, very fortunate that, you know, Walmart took a bet on a on a very small supplier and didn't just take a bet on me, but actually helped me overcome some hurdles that without their assistance, I don't know if I would have overcome. Together with Walmart, these businesses have made an incredible impact in their community and helped others live better. You can check out great products from women-owned companies at your local Walmart or at walmart.com slash celebrate her. It's a new year and you deserve a fresh start in all parts of your life, even at work. Take your team to the next level with a hiring partner that makes it simple to find candidates with the right skills. That's Indeed. Indeed makes it easy to attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy. And more than 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash therapy. Offer valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com slash therapy to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash therapy. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Something that I have also been thinking about with both Love is Blind, with Married at First Sight, I don't think there are any other dating shows that I've been really watching as much as I've watched like Love is Blind and Married at First Sight. So specifically about those, I am beginning to question the psychological risk of going on some of these shows. You and I had a conversation last year about Paige from last season of Married at First Sight. Dr. Joy, I was finally healing. <laughs> we were trying to move on, but I got to bring it back. So her from last season, even Chris from this season, Katina, I'm starting to worry about from this season, Deep D from this season of Love is Blind. And I haven't fully articulated this or thought it all the way out. So that's why I'm bringing it to you to see what you're thinking. I know that there are risks in any relationship, right? You know, like you start dating somebody and you don't know whether they're going to be ridiculous and you're going to have your feelings hurt and it's going to be painful for you. But it does feel like there is a particular threat to your mental health when you go on these shows and it doesn't go well in the ways at least that we see it right now, it could be editing that gives us a much drabber picture than like the lived experience of it. But especially for like Paige, and I think even for Deep D this season, as a viewer, it felt very hard to watch because of what we were seeing. And so it is making me question like the threat to your mental health that can appear if you go on one of these shows and it's not successful. Yeah, I've had similar conversations and, I would imagine for liability reasons that there are psychological assessments before one of these people are um, casted on the show. I will say what really had me thinking about that was with Danielle and when she was triggered and all that. And Mm -hmm. I was wondering like, oh, I wonder if there's a therapist there to help her because that can easily head into a dangerous situation. So I think as a measure of keeping the cast safe, not just physically with bodyguards, but also emotionally and mentally safe, that I would hope that there is, well, as for Netflix, I know that with maths, they have the experts on there. Mm -hmm. I will hope that there's definitely therapists, you know, accessible to the cast and if not, you know, you can email me at info at beverlyonsford.com <laughs> and I will, not joking, but jokingly, but not jokingly, 
you don't know these people from a can of paint and they don't know each other from a can of paint. And so if we really want to give these couples a fair shot, thinking about Danielle and Nick, Nick is out here, you know, at the beach and she's in a whole mental state where she is triggered and she's having an episode that would have definitely been a moment one for a therapist to be there with her to coach her and help her be grounded and also help Nick who's her husband well no not her husband at the time but soon to be right. husband participate in that because if you're in a relationship with someone who struggles with their mental health or who has a mental illness you are also a part of that as well you are living with them, you are able to support them, or you're able to hinder them because you don't have the tools. So I think that would have been a great moment for Danielle and Nick one to build emotional intimacy because then she would know that, okay, well, I feel even safer with him because he has the tools to kind of help me navigate through this as opposed to they end up having an argument and it's Danielle versus Nick, Mm -hmm. right? I think they were unmet expectations because they were unsaid because someone didn't really know. I think if the premise of this show is to help these couples actually make it to the altar, that would definitely be something that I would include in the show in terms of therapeutic intervention with the therapist while they're at the honeymoon or doing other things as well. You know, I do have my passport, so... (laughs) You are ready to travel. (laughs) So if you were, let's say on a future season of season three of Love is Blind comes out and you are the therapist, maybe there in the moment, but in a post-show kind of situation, like what kinds of things do you think would be helpful for couples coming out of a situation like this to kind of give them the best chance of like continuing in the health of their relationship? So I would go ahead and people may say that, oh, he is above it, but I would definitely want to have sessions with Shake. (laughs) I would definitely want to have sessions with Shake to really understand how did the choices that you made to say certain things, what was that really connected to? Because I know Deep T asked those questions, like for somebody you said that was your friend and, and all these things, you met my family. How could you be so nasty towards me? I would really want to have him on my couch and let's really process that because I think what other people are seeing now, like he kind of like doubled down in the reunion and then doubled down in some of his posts, but then like posted something else that was like an apology. Right. So I don't know what's going on. And he has reported receiving hate messages and all of that. And whether you like him or not, there's a certain way to go about communicating to people. And that can definitely have an effect on his mental health. I'm not a proponent for internet violence or sending hate messages. And whether or not somebody else believes that he deserves it, he has to now bear that. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? He has to bear that. In addition to Deep G, maybe finding out all of the things that he was actually saying. I don't know if that affected her, but there needs to be like a recovery repair period with the cast members. Definitely. Even with like Shane and Shayna, mm. you know, everybody was calling Shayna Jessica 2.0, <laughs> you know, I don't know how she's responding to that or people just calling you a villain or saying all these things about Shane and Shane literally just lost his dad. Like he said, what, Three months before the show, right. we don't know how his grief is affecting him and all these things and how that affected him and Natalie. But you can clearly see that they both have love for each other still, still communicate with each other. So it's not like what their experiences were outside of the camera was so devastating that they didn't still try to repair and to still move on. Mm-hmm. Got it. Oh, yeah. So anything else you would do specifically with hypothetical season three with couples who do decide to stay together? Like what kind of post-show interventions or questions might you have them walk through? I would definitely ask who's part of your support system outside of the show? Like who's going to really encourage you guys when the world starts to see all of this? Who's going to help protect you? Because To bear all of that just as a duo is hard. Mm -hmm. You need your family. You need your friends. You need your support systems. Also, I would want to do like an intensive with the couples and say, okay, there's a new level of fame that will come with this. 
What are your non-negotiables? How do you guys want to deal with this together? And what are you guys not okay with dealing together? If there's any of you, well, we're not interviewing. Okay, well, please don't post this or let's keep our lives a little bit more private until this kind of dies down. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that the couple is on the same page as for many topics as possible. I think the last thing would definitely be, are there any residual concerns from the show that have not been addressed. So by the time these other folks see it and start having commentary, we don't want this to be an even added stressor on the relationship. So let's talk about the residuals. Mm, Those are all great points. And I do think that that's something that does work in their favor because by the time we see it, it's really, at least for season two, it had been almost a year, right? So they have had time to process and get prepared for what we were going to see. So those questions I feel like would be spot on with what they needed to anticipate as they were waiting for it to premiere. Right. Yeah. So anything else about this season that we haven't talked about that you really want to share something about? Okay, so I'm just thinking about like all the couples, like Shane and Kyle, who like were coupled. You can't compromise on religion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Shane and Kyle. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's different things that compromising. Not saying that you can't, because some people do. But if somebody says that I am this, and the other person says I am this, and it directly conflicts, and you are second guessing, do yourself and the other person a favor and just leave it be. Unless you have two beliefs that may be different, but can still coexist. Mm -hmm. Don't set yourself up. Don't compromise. Because I know Kyle did a lot of compromise. And the man doesn't eat meat. He ate meat for her. He doesn't believe in God or anything else. But he was like, I'm going to start. Like, if you feel like you have to change your core values to be with somebody, you really need to question that. Yeah. With Danielle and Nick. Being in a relationship with somebody who struggles with their mental health or mental illness is another commitment as well. Be okay, ready, and willing to be with the fullness of that person. You can't X out what you don't like. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be all in, be all in. Ayana and Jarrett, even after betrayal, you can still build emotional intimacy. You can still have the relationship that you want. It's not an end-all, be-all. And if you allow naysayers to infiltrate, then... It's going to impact your relationship. Mallory and Sal. Family is important and they have influence. Be mindful of it. Be careful of it. Because that influence may be for good. It may not be for good. Natalie and Shane, words matter. They hurt and they can have a long lasting impact. Because something that Natalie said, I believe, at the reunion was that even afterwards we tried to make it work. He has apologized. He's done all of the things. But it was a struggle for me to move forward based off of the things that he said. So when in disagreements or having an argument, be mindful to protect your partner with your words because it can build up or it can break your relationship. And then what deep D and shake it's okay to walk away from someone that you have great vibes with, but ultimately doesn't respect you. Mm, That's a mic drop. Cause, Cause deep D said that she was like, at the end of the day, this is my best friend and all of that. But because I know that there's a party that doesn't respect me or doesn't like me, I'm not willing to compromise me in order to be in relationship with you. Mm-hmm. Love it. That's it. I mean, well, you have given us some great lessons for our own lives that we can take. I had to break down all the couples. I'm like, I had thoughts about each and every one yeah. of them. And I'm like. Let me just break it down real quick. We appreciate it. We appreciate that breakdown. So tell us again, Beverly, where we can find you online to your website, as well as any social media handles you'd like to share. Oh, my website is Beverly Andre Beverly with an L E Y. Cause my mom is fancy.com <laughs> and on all socials, Beverly Andre underscore. Cause somebody stole my name. So we had to have that little underscore. <laughs> We will be sure to include all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me again to break down our faves in pop culture. I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm so glad Beverly was able to join me again this week. To learn more about her and her work, 
be sure to visit the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 251. And be sure to text two of your girls and tell them to check out the episode right now. If you're looking for a therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic or just be in community with other sisters, come on over and join us in the sister circle. It's our cozy corner of the internet designed just for black women. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. This episode was produced by Frida Lucas and Elise Ellis, and editing was done by Dennis and Bradford. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care. This podcast is supported by FX's Atlanta. Returns March 24th on FX. Stream on Hulu. Europe hits different. Atlanta season three takes Paperboy, Earn, Van, and Darius across the pond, and they diving deep with new success, new connections, and new weird. <laughs> FX's Atlanta premieres March 24th on FX. Stream on Hulu. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all in one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Many of you know that I'm currently writing my first book, Sisterhood Heals which is scheduled to be released in the summer of 2023. And our team was able to use Squarespace to create a beautiful landing page at sisterhoodheels.com that will be able to evolve as the book gets closer to publication. Right now, it's set up to gather emails from those interested in learning more and who'll be ready to hit purchase when the pre-order link comes out. But I'm also planning to share some blog posts with some behind-the-scenes thoughts and inspiration. And all of it is fully optimized for mobile so that it looks great no matter what device you use to view it. Is there a new project you're working on this year? Head to squarespace.com slash TFBG for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, enter code TFBG to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Every five and a half minutes, a person in the U.S. dies of a drug overdose. Each of these deaths is tragic and preventable through harm reduction. Resources are available to reduce overdose deaths and protect the health of people who use drugs. Harm reduction includes access to sterile syringes to stop the spread of HIV and hepatitis C and naloxone to prevent fatal overdoses. It saves lives and keeps people safe. Harm reduction provides judgment-free support and meets people wherever they are at today. Please visit supportharmreduction.org to learn more. Brought to you by Vital Strategies.